people are really rather afraid that this country might be rather swamped by people with a different culture. And you know, the British character has done so much for democracy, for law, and done so much throughout the world, that if there's any fear that it might be swamped, people are going to react and be rather hostile to those coming in. So if you want good race relations, you've got to allay people's fears on numbers. That's one thing that's driving some people to the National Front. They don't agree with the objectives of the National Front, but they say that at least they're talking about some of the problems. Now, we, the big political parties, if we don't want people to go to extremes, and I don't, we ourselves must talk about this problem. Why do people stop us in the street almost and tell us that Margaret Thatcher isn't just inflexible, she's not just single-minded, on occasion she's plain pig-headed and won't be told by Would anyone. Would you tell me who has stopped you in the street and said that? Ordinary Britons. Where? In conversation. But I thought you had just come from Belize. Oh, this is not the first time we've been here. Will you tell me who and where and when? Ordinary Britons in restaurants, in How many? Cabs. How many? I would say at least one in two. I'm sorry, it's an expression I've never heard. Tell me who has said it to you, when These, and These are where. people that we meet in passing. But and we obviously raise the question of the, the state of their country with them. And they tell us, yes, we have a tough part, Prime Minister, but she's a little bit pig-headed. She won't be told by anybody. Isn't this interesting? Even the tone of voice you're using is changing from what you used earlier. I am determined. Of course I am. I am proud of my country. It can do a great deal better than it is doing. I believe it will do better, and my policies will be shown to be right. Uh, Mrs Thatcher, why, when the uh, Belgrano, the Argentinian mm. battleship, was outside the exclusion zone and actually sailing away from the Falklands, uh, why did you give the orders to sink it? But it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was in an area which was a danger to our ships and to our people on them. Outside it, the exclusion zone, then, uh, But it was in an area which we had warned at the end of April, we had given warnings that all ships in those areas, if they represented a danger to our ships, were vulnerable. Let me ask you this, vulnerable. Mrs. Good. What, what motive are you seeking to attach to Mrs. Thatcher and her government in this? Is it inefficiency, lack of communication, or well, is it a desire for action, a desire for It war? is a desire for action and a lack of communications because on giving those orders to sink the Belgrano when it was actually sailing away from our fleet and away from the Falklands was in effect sabotaging any possibility of any peace plan succeeding and Mrs Thatcher had 14 hours in which to consider the Peruvian peace plan that was being put forward to her in which those 14 hours those orders could have been rescinded. Right, Mrs Thatcher. One day all of the facts in about 30 years' time will be published. That I lifted is the not good enough, Mrs. Thatcher. I am we just... Mrs. Gould, would let, you let, please let Mrs. Thatcher answer. Let me I think answer. You've, you've put a fair point. Would you please let me answer? I lived with the responsibility for a very long time. I answered the question, giving the facts, not anyone's opinions, but the facts. Those Peruvian peace proposals, which were only in outline, did not reach London until after the attack on the Belgrano. That is fact. Uh, I'm sorry, that is fact, and I am going to finish. Did not reach London until after the attack on the Belgrano. Moreover, we went on negotiating for another fortnight after that attack. I think it could only be in Britain that a prime minister was accused of sinking an enemy ship that was a danger to our navy when my main motive was to protect the boys in our navy. That was my main motive, um, and I'm very proud of it. Mrs. Good, One Hatcher. day, all the facts will be revealed, and they will indicate, as I have said. Mrs. It was Disraeli One Nation. We've had an increase of home ownership, the heart of the family, Can I under this question, government. Please, Prime Minister, you ask me the most fundamental thing. Well, I know, I but must we're not having a party political broadcast. We're having an interview which must please, depend on me asking some questions yes, occasionally. Indeed. You, when you ask what I know you call the gut question, right, it's gone to the gut, it's gone to the jugular. Let me finish it. We'll hear from Dudley West. Mrs. Mm. what have you called for a national referendum on the return of capital punishment? 
I will give you the, 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 what I think is the actual correct answer and say that I believe in it. We have referenda in this country only really for constitutional matters. It was a constitutional matter when we yeah. went into the common market, a great constitutional matter. We had them on when Scot whether Scotland wished to have devolved government <coughs> or Wales. Which, that was a constitutional matter. It's not been part of our custom to have a referendum on particular things. And I think if we were to go to that, we'd alter fundamentally our parliamentary system. First, we'd have to put a bill through to have that particular referendum. I think if we had it on that, then we'd have it on a large number of other things and we'd alter the nature of the debate. I also think that referenda in this country are only advisory. And I must tell you that I don't think it would alter the view of members of parliament who are elected and would make up their own views. Now, I say that all with great regret, but I think it's the right answer because I happen to believe that when some criminals go out and do such hideous, cruel crimes, and in particular, when they do such terrible things to children, I think they've forfeited their own right to life. And so I personally, I personally, have always voted to retain capital punishment. It may be the case that in private, you will have a lusty argument and you will listen to other people's opinions and that you're only too happy to accept the suggestion if it's correct. But you never come over in public like that, ever. You come over as being someone who one of your backbenchers said is slightly off her trolley, authoritarian, domineering, refusing to listen to anybody else. Why? Why cannot you publicly project what you have just told me is your private character? Brian, if anyone's coming over as domineering in this interview, it's you. <laughs> it's you. You think Hammering so? Hammering things out instead of just talking them in a, in a conversational way. Yes, you're very domineering at the moment. Now let's deal with the authoritarian thing quietly. Well, could I just, first of all, ask you to recall what must have been a very difficult meeting of the Cabinet? Yes, Bernard of course it was. Of course it was. You don't take a decision like that without it being difficult, without heartbreak. Heartbreak there may have been, but it was the right decision. But you had to get through it. Bernard Ingham in his memoirs has said that it was a traumatic experience. Those are his words. Yes, it was. And it would have been very strange if it hadn't been. But we got through it. In fact, you broke down. We got through the house. You broke down during the cabinet, didn't you? Yes, but I carried on. And then the house? By that time, I was back fighting fit, as you saw. Just before that, though, the image that people will perhaps remember, you said the cabinet was extremely difficult. And then you had to come out into Downing Street, and you had to face the cameras. Mm -hmm. In effect, you had to face the world. Mm -hmm. You had to come and make what was perhaps the statement of your life. And then mm. I see that, you know, we notice now that it's affecting you now, and it must have been yes, the most Yes, it's not affecting my thing. voice now. It's not affecting my voice. You're thinking back to traumatic things. Um, but I managed to get through them. I managed to get through the television. I managed to get through the cabinet. Again, because there was something else to do. I had to um, uh, get on to people, and I must say this, for Douglas Hurd and John Major said, if you wish to go on, we will propose you and second you again. And, and that was marvellous. That was marvellous. And then I one had to uh, get through cabinet, and one or two people wanted to leave because they too, of course, wanted to, to make provision for their own, uh, for their own uh, candidature. Quite right. Quite right. By that time, I had other things to do, and so I got on with them. David Longy says that <clears throat> when he came to visit you at Downing Street, that you declaimed to him, that you addressed him as if he were in the back row of a public meeting. Uh, he uh, said that you spoke as if you were at the Nuremberg Rally when he went to see you at uh, Downing Street. I might say so. That is very offensive bearing in mind that Britain and the Commonwealth stood alone against Nazi tyranny for quite a time. And unless we had 
it would not have been beaten and the rest of Europe would not have been free. New Zealand was part of that though, Lady Thatcher. Didn't a New Zealand Prime Minister deserve to New be Zealand treated better than that when he called upon I didn't. I expect other Prime Ministers to be able to argue their case as I can argue mine. What I am saying was that they were denied ports, were denied to us, although we had our ships in the Pacific on their regular duties as part of the defense of the free world, as part of the deterrence against a third world. He says he did argue it with you. You didn't listen. Oh, I did listen. I had no sympathy with the arguments. But, uh, but you asked, during that period, you come back from Paris and you've asked the dramatic section here at the end. You've asked Douglas Heard formally to nominate you for the second battle. Douglas was extremely good throughout. And then you, dramatic moment, you telephone John Major in Huntington. Tell me exactly what happened. Well, Douglas had said that, that he would, of course, propose me, and naturally then I turned to John Major. It just seemed to me that there was a, just a little kind of pause, and then I wondered, well, perhaps I was being super sensitive, as one might be at that time. And how long was the pause? Well, a pause is not very long, but it's a pause. You know, <laughs> you're very sensitive at that time. Yes, no, I but was but, it? Uh, he did. He did. And then um, I supported him afterwards mm. very strongly because I thought he was the best person. Yes. And you said, in fact, here and in the, uh, the, on page 861, I think it is, at the end of your account, you say here, you quote the words that you said on your way out of 10 Downing Street. Now it's time for a new chapter to open. And I wish John Major all the luck in the world. He will be splendidly served, and he has the makings of a great Prime Minister, which I'm sure he will be in a very short time. Has he made that yet? I think he has carried out his duties. Each Prime Minister does it in their own way and in their own style. And they must not be influenced or... Uh, pilloried in any way by the styles of other prime ministers before. Each of us was different. Each of us approached our task in a different way. I was very much a conviction politician. That was part of my history. I'd come up through years of socialism. I'd seen what they'd done to Britain. So Keith Joseph and I had started again from first principles with conviction. And we'd started to work out the policies which stem from those principles. And they worked. And the irony is that there have been policies which have been followed by the rest of the world. But has he become... A great prime minister yet, as you well, predicted. Give him a little bit more time. Give him a little more time. A little more time and no threat of leadership elections. I myself think those elections should never take place during a prime ministership. They're invented after uh, Ted, unfortunately, had lost three elections out of four. They're invented for a time when we're in opposition. It's kind of a gimmick on my show. Uh, and it's to make a jump, just to stand up and make a jump up in the air. I shouldn't dream of doing that. Why should I? Well, I see no significance whatsoever of making a jump up in the air. I made great leaps forward, not little jumps in studios. <laughs> you know, I just won a bet. Because where I work, everybody betted whether you should make a jump or not. And Certainly I, not. And I was almost the only one who said that you would never do shouldn't it. shouldn't I think it's a silly thing to ask. Yes. I think it's a puerile thing to ask, yes. And Gorbachev did it. You amaze me. Yes? I wonder what he thought of the politics of a free society, if that's what they ask you to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people find it, you know, just amusing. It's just, it's just a way of showing another side of people, you know, because the people I interview are so used to talking and talking. But when well, I wasn't used to talking. I was used to doing more than little jumps. Okay. But it's hard for you to show what you do in an interview. But... You can stand up and you can make like a little jump. It just, you know, it just What's shows another it? side. It just shows another side of human being, you know, because everybody jumps in their I'll own tell way. you what it shows. It shows that you want to be thought to be normal or popular. I don't have to say that or approve it. This has been my whole life. Now, it's, it's just a gimmick, you know. I mean, people know oh, that. Right. But... No. <laughs> uh, no, 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 to coin a phrase. <laughs>